kept going back to red. Sometimes I see red. But that's only with my wife. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it has been a pleasure to be here this week. Um, you know, this congregation is a little different than some. And I mentioned in the first uh, episode or the first night that y- your reputation precedes you. And, and Jonathan said, well, you know, I wonder what that means. Well, it's good. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, your zest and your zeal for the Lord is very, very evident. I like the theme song. I think not only the theme song, but the idea of a theme song. It's been a great unifying uh, song to bring us to, back to our topic each, each, each service. Um, I appreciate also little things. First of all, just your friendliness and your kindness, but also even the order of your worship. Now, I'm not a traditionalist. I don't think it really matters what order of worship we have. There is no set order in the Scriptures. But, you know, I got to thinking, in most congregations, and this is not to say anything bad about that because we do this at home, you know, we have the Lord's Supper kind of after the sermon. And it makes it a little harder maybe for a speaker to set through the Lord's Supper uh, and give his sermon afterwards because he keeps thinking about his sermon (laughs) rather than the Lord. But, you know, really, in reality, what should come first? The Lord. That's why we're here. Anything the speaker says may be an addition to bring our minds back to the Lord, but it's just a conduit to bring us back to the most important thing, and that's Jesus Christ. And I love the idea of having that memorial service. After we praise God, then we just come into that memorial service, and I appreciate that so much. I also appreciate this meeting. I did not realize uh, when I was asked to come this year for the meeting that there was going to be so many young people here. And I know this congregation is blessed with young people. And by the way, there are many congregations, faithful congregations throughout the world who have no young people. Because sometimes, typically it's the older folks, sometimes it's typically the women who are more spiritually minded. Men, typically, even in foreign countries, don't necessarily come and respond to the gospel like the ladies do. And children, of course, sometimes seem not to think it's important to put God in their lives. But but you all have not only in this congregation had young people and shown that to them. But there are those who I know who have come in. And you parents who have brought these children, these young people, these kids, uh, these teenagers in, thank you. Because not only does it uh, instill with them the importance of the Lord, but it also allows them to meet others who are going through some of the same difficulties that they are going through. I grew up in very tiny congregations as a kid, isolated, where there were no children. In fact, sometimes after I was baptized, Dad and I were the only ones to do anything in that little congregation. And it's very discouraging. So then, thank you. Thank you to this congregation. Thanks to the elders. And I'm sorry Mark wasn't able to be here this week, but he had some health issues. But thank you, Lonnie. Thank you to the congregation, to the sisters, to all of those who have prepared all of these things that have happened uh, this entire week. Now, as we've noted, our theme, of course, is the Gospel of Matthew. Now, when you write a commentary on anything, it's a little more analytical. It's a little bit more technical. And it's not necessarily very exciting, because you're getting down into the nitty-gritty of what a text means. But sometimes when you're going through a section, for example, Matthew, you'll run across something that you think, wow, this would really preach well. This would really be a great sermon because it's got so much in it that we can share in different areas and directions. And so what I want to do this morning is break from the tradition of the PowerPoint and the more analytical side. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture that is one of my favorites. And if you've gone to any of the meetings that I've held in the area, uh, you've probably heard this. So I just beg your pardon for that. But it's where Peter confesses the identity of Jesus Christ. It's Matthew 16. And, you know, we've got this little joke uh, that uh, Keith Thompson and I and some of my traveling partners, partners around the world have. And that is, when we go to a new place, oftentimes we begin with Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, or something in that vicinity, because everything relates. It's about the about the the promise of who Jesus is and what He's going to do and what He's going to build. And so you can kind of just use that as the springboard to build anything, whether it's doctrinal or practical. And so it's just a really great passage. Well, what I'm going to do this morning is invite your attention to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to stay pretty much right with the text. So I'll pull my Bible out in a moment. But this is a very interesting passage because here in Matthew 16 we have Jesus eliciting from his own, those that he has trained, 
about what they think or believe him to be. Now, one of the things I'm going to emphasize in this lesson, and I'll do that more in a moment, but I want us all to think about who Jesus is. Now, we've made the point that Matthew portrays Jesus as the king, that Matthew portrays Jesus' kingdom. And so, I first of all want to ask you, what do you think of Jesus? What do you think of the authority of Jesus? And are you in the kingdom of Jesus? And we will develop that in a few minutes. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, we also have a very interesting chronological season in Jesus' life. Now, I've made mention over and over that Matthew is not overly chronological. He's very thematic. But now, we come to Matthew 16, and Jesus is probably about six months from going the Jericho Road to Jerusalem and being crucified. So, the apostles have been with Jesus probably three years. They've been with Jesus a long time. And what we're going to see is Jesus does something very, very interesting. He removes himself from all the hubbub, all the crowds, and he takes them to a region way up north called Caesarea Philippi. Now, let me set some background there before we look at the text. Caesarea Philippi, of course, is in the northernmost part of the land of Palestine. Now, if you look at a map today of Israel, Palestine, you'll notice that, of course, you have various sections. Like, for example, politically, you have the West Bank and so on and so forth. But now, in Jesus' day, the land of Palestine was divided into three sections. You had the northernmost part, which is Galilee. And then to the middle part, you have the land of Samaria, the Samaritans, of course, which the Jews hated. And then in the south, you had Judea, which was where Jerusalem was. Now, Jesus did not base his ministry after he was born and made his trip to Egypt and then came back to Nazareth. He did not base his ministry in Jerusalem. That's where all the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious colleges were, so to speak. That's where all the PhDs were. That's where the temple was. That's where the sacrificial system was taking place. Jesus didn't go there. He went way up north to Galilee to the little city called Capernaum. It was a little fishing village right on the Sea of Galilee, and there he based his ministry. It was there that he called fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, John, such as those, and then also Matthew, the tax collector. He called people who were workers, average workers of that day. But Jesus based his ministry there, and except for maybe a couple or three trips down to Jerusalem for maybe the feast days, such as Passover, which was a requirement for all Jewish males, Jesus primarily stayed up in Galilee around the Sea of Galilee. But now, on this occasion in Matthew 16, Jesus is going to do something even more remarkable. He's going to take his apostles, this little band of followers, not only to Capernaum, which they had already been at and had been around, but he takes them even further north. Now, you know, this area, by the way, was not the most religious area in the world. In fact, Galilee itself was not a very religious area. The people of Galilee were often steeped in shall we say, paganism. They often had, had trouble, you know, they were removed from Jerusalem, so they were kind of considered country hicks, way up there in the north, and they just weren't really all that faithful in some ways. And so, Jesus, of course, bases his ministry there. Why? Because that's where the sinners are. Now, there's sinners in Jerusalem too, but that's where the people need the great light that the gospel talks about when Jesus bases his ministry there. But now, on this occasion, Jesus has been working. He has been busy now for at least two and a half years, maybe longer. And it's time for him to take a break. But Jesus never takes a break. So, what he does is he goes up to a little town called Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi, as it was called in Jesus' day, was really a town with rich history. If you go back to the Old Testament, this area was the area of what is called the tribe of Dan, or part of the tribe of Dan. And up there at this area, there was a, a town called Dan. In fact, when you remember and you read the scriptures about the length and width and breadth and all that of Israel, you'll find sometimes the Bible saying, from Dan to Beersheba. Well, Beersheba was a town down there in the Negev, in the, in the desert, way down south of Jerusalem. But the limits of Israel went from down in Bathsheba all the way up to Dan in the very north. Now, Dan situ was situated at the base of Mount Hermon. 
Mount Hermon is, even today, a beautiful mountain. Now, unfortunately, because of global warming, it doesn't have the snow caps that it once did. But nonetheless, it's a beautiful mountain, and often it is part of the Psalms and other places, the dews, the snows of Hermon. It's a beautiful area. And in that area in Jesus' day, there was a cave. And that cave that really was part of the site of this beginning uh, precipice of Mount Hermon had a spring. And that spring was where the waters, the headwaters of the Jordan River began. The snows would melt on Mount Hermon, they would, matric- uh, they would trick- trickle down through the rock, and they would form a pool, and then they would gush out, and that water then would flow eventually all the way to the Dead Sea. So it's a beautiful area. It is lush, it is green, there are springs. But now, there was something else that happened back up there. Now, of course, in the ancient Israel's time, Dan was one of the tribes that had come into the nation of Israel, or to the land of Palestine under the hand of Joshua, Moses' successor. Now, God had told them to drive out the paganism of the land, but they didn't do that. And so, that area up north, that Dan area, became known for its paganism. In fact, during the period of what we call the divided kingdom, you remember in about 1000 BC, the kingdom of Israel split with 10 tribes going north and two tribes coming south. One of the places that Jeroboam, the religious upstart that took the 10 tribes north, set up a golden altar was at Dan. Dan up north, they had paganism going on in the name of religion. So, this was an area that even in the Old Testament was not very filled with religious fervor. It was not a good area. It was the wrong side of the tracks when it came to religion. Now, that didn't get much better. Because when Jesus was upon the scene, now time had gone by, the area had changed some, and the town of Dan was now changed to a name of Caesarea Philippi after Caesar and then his son Philip. It was changed to Caesarea Philippi, but it still had paganism. In fact, even if you go there today, you can see at that very place where the water comes out of the mountain, these niches in the rock, and that's where they would place their stone gods and goddesses, and they would worship. And there was a big temple there to paganism. It was not a religious area, at least not religious in the truest sense. And so, it is this area that Jesus takes His apostles to And you might think, why in the world? This is like going to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is not a good place to take your apostles who are still trying to learn the truth. But now we've got an interesting situation here because remember, Jesus has been with His apostles for probably two and a half years or so. This is kind of what I would call graduation. You know, sometimes when you go to school and maybe you uh, take a test or you have a big date coming up, not date as in romantic, but a date of graduation, maybe you'll have a final exam. When you write a thesis for a master's degree or a PhD, you're going to write a a thesis sometimes, and then you're going to go before uh, an exam board, and you're going to have a final test. Well, this is kind of the final test. Because you see, they had been with Jesus for all of this time. They had walked with Him. They had talked with Him. They had eaten with Him. They had slept on the ground beside Him. They had heard Him, they had seen the miracles, and what do you think they're thinking? Sometimes I think the apostles weren't. But you know, we got to give them a break, cut them a break, because they're human just like us. But Jesus takes them up into the heart of this paganism to ask them this question. Now, we don't know that Jesus was literally at the base of this spring in Mount Hermon, but He was close. And He's going to use that illustration of a rock in just a few minutes in this narrative. But Jesus takes them up there, and He begins to quiz them about who He is, what's His identity. Now, it's interesting how Jesus begins that, because if you pick up the text with me in Matthew chapter 16, and verse 13, it says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, let me just say a couple of things, first of all, about the term Son of Man. Now, Jesus was both divine and He was both human, 100%. We can't understand that, we can't fully fathom that, but Jesus was truly the God-man. 
And so many times when we think of the phrase Son of Man, which is, by the way, the most favorite uh, pass, or, uh, uh, epithet that Jesus uses for Himself, it's the favorite moniker that Jesus places on Himself. He will use this over and over, like 80 times. But nonetheless, Jesus says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And we often think, well, He's asking them, what do people think about me physically, or about Jesus physically? And that, that's true, that is included. But now in the Old Testament, when you see the phrase Son of Man, it not only can refer to one's humanity, such as Ezekiel was called the Son of Man, with a little m and a little s. But in Daniel, the term Son of Man was used in reference to the coming Messiah. The Messiah, the one likened to the Son of Man, appears before God's throne, and He's given a kingdom. So when Jesus uses the term Son of Man, He is not saying, well, what do you think about me as a human? Am I good looking? Do I dress nice? No, no, He's not asking that. He is asking uh, and using the title that reminds them of who He really is beyond all the trappings of the human body. So when you read Son of Man, think human, yes, but also think deity. But now Jesus says, who do men say, or humanity, or the people on the street say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now there was a lot of confusion. Because Jesus had walked and talked and been with not only the apostles, but He had been out there in Jerusalem, He had been in Samaria, He had been, you know, in Galilee. There were a lot of thoughts and confusion about who Jesus was. You know, that's kind of an odd issue, because if I saw someone raising the dead, and I knew literally, literally they had raised the dead, I don't know that I'd have much of a question about where this person came from. I might have a lot of questions, but this person's got to be, you know, from God, if he can really do that. Of course, back at this time especially. But Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Now, you know, today, if you were to go out on the street, or you were to go to school, or the university, or work, or whatever, and you would just say, who is Jesus? Well, first of all, surprisingly enough, you might, not, you might not get an answer. Because I have been to places where people did not know about Jesus. We take a lot for granted because we live in kind of the Bible Belt, you know, a land that is filled with Bibles. But now, we are becoming more and more um, secularized in this country, I dare say paganized, and there will come a time, probably in some of these kids' lifetimes, where most people won't know much about Jesus. And so, when you ask people about Jesus, they may have any number of answers. They may have heard things about Jesus, or they may have maybe been to church, or maybe they have a grandfather who went to church. So, they may have an inkling of who Jesus is, but they're not going to know Jesus like we know Jesus. Because culture continues to degrade, as far as Jesus is concerned, right now. But now, when you go out there, you're going to find a lot of answers. If I were to go out on the street right today, I feel confident that I could find various opinions about who Jesus is. Now, if I go, for example, let's just start kind of the A-list, the atheist. The atheist would say, Jesus, well, I've heard about Him. And you would say, well, is He the Son of God? Son of God? There isn't even a God in the, in the universe. What do you mean, Son of God? There certainly can't be a Son if there's not a God. So the atheist would say, no, there's no God, there's no God's sons, because Jesus is not God's son, He was just a human. If you were to go to the Muslim, now they revere Jesus, and rightly so, but not as the Son of God. Because you see, according to their theology, God is fiercely one. He is one in the sense of He doesn't have a Holy Spirit and a Son that are different personalities, or that are three in one, the Trinity as we sometimes call it, for lack of a better term. They would say, no, Jesus was a prophet. He wasn't a great prophet quite as much as Muhammad, but He was a great prophet in the sense that He did a lot of good. But they're not going to believe that He is the Son of God. They're not going to believe that He is deity, not in the truest sense that we would believe. So then maybe you look at uh, maybe some other Jewish religion or something and say, well, what do you think about the Son of God? What do you think about Jesus? And they say, well, He wasn't the Son of God. He was a rabbi. He was a great rabbi. He was a great teacher. But again, they go to Deuteronomy 6 where the Shema, as it's called, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And they use that phrase and the uh, interpretation, which I believe is wrong, to say, no, God is one. He doesn't have a son. So, you're going to get all kinds of answers. 
If you go to maybe someone who has been raised in the East, in China, or in one of those uh, areas where you have the Buddhisms and the Confuciusisms and all those other isms, you might say, well, who is Jesus? And if they know, they might say, uh, or have heard of him, they may say, well, he wasn't the son of God because, hey, we're all sons of God. We are all part of the divine. We have a divine spark within us, and so we're all part of the divine. But, but he was a great uh, Buddha. He was a great enlightened one. In other words, he had something special. He had more of this spark than the normal person. But the Son of God? No, we're all gods. We're all deity. So, in the end, again, you're going to find all of these various approaches to this question. Now, it would not have been those answers that these apostles or Jesus would have received, but it would have been a variety of answers. Now, these people were Jews. And, of course, they knew that there was going to be a Messiah that would come. They knew that that individual had to be from the descendants of David, but they seemed to be confused about who Jesus was in spite of the fact that as the Son of God, he was doing miracles and doing things that no man could do unless God was with him. And so Jesus takes his apostles, and he brings them up north into this pagan environment, and he starts peppering them with these questions. Now, why did he do that? First of all, why did he even go up north? Well, I think there's two reasons. And I'm not saying these are definitive reasons, but number one, he wanted the apostles to really be able to express who he is because they're the ones within six months that's going to be hitting the road and going into all the world with the Great Commission. You got to know what you believe if you're really going to be successful in a task. You got to be committed to the task. And so this is sort of a statement of commitment. But also in chapter 17, Jesus is getting ready to go up on what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, which I personally believe was Mount Hermon. In fact, they're right there at the base. And in the next chapter, they go up, and Jesus' divinity is revealed. There is the appearance of Moses and Elijah, the typification of the law and the prophets, with Jesus standing there, and his divinity is stripped away, and he is glorious. He's preparing them for who he really is. You know, someday Jesus will come in his glory. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's going to be incredible. Now, Jesus then asks them, who do men say that I am? Well, look, notice the answers. All of these answers begin to come back. Some say you are John the Baptist. Well, now you remember from our studies the other evening who John the Baptist is. He is the cousin of Jesus. He is the one that was prophesied in Malachi 4, 5 to be the forerunner of Jesus. And... Many times when you look at the message of John and Jesus, it's basically the same. John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus comes along and says the exact same thing. They are preaching the exact same sermons. And so some thought, well, maybe it's John the Baptist. But now there's a problem with that. Because in back a couple chapters earlier in chapter 14, John the Baptist has been beheaded. And in other words, his life is gone. He's been buried. The the apostles came and got his body and buried it. John the Baptist is is no more. Now, that didn't stop the superstitious tales from running around, though. In fact, Herod himself, Herod Antipas, who had had him killed, when he heard Jesus, he didn't know who Jesus was either, but he said, oh, this is John the Baptist risen from the dead. And he's trembling. He is scared to death because, you see, they believed in that sort of thing back then. I think sometimes today, by the way, we think we're too big to believe in the resurrection of any concept. But listen, we're going to rise someday. There's going to be a resurrection. But nonetheless, Herod is quaking in his boots. So it couldn't have been John the Baptist, even though their mission was the same, unless John had risen from the dead. But now others say, well, maybe he's Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet that saw his people carried away into Babylonian captivity. He wept over their faithlessness and over the punishment that God was going to bring to that nation in 586 B.C. Jesus did much the same in Matthew 24 as he weeps over the city. He knows that pretty soon within a generation that whole city is going to be razed to the ground. It's going to be destroyed, not one stone left upon another, and millions of people are going to be displaced. Jesus weeps over that. He says, you know, how often would I have gathered you together under my arms as a hen gathers her little chicks in a storm under under her wings, but you would have none of it. 
So maybe Jesus' message, maybe it was time, sometimes it was sorrowful. Maybe they said, well, Jeremiah, you know, maybe it, this is the Old Testament Jeremiah that's come back. Others thought he was Elijah. In other words, they thought he was one who was going to come back and prepare the way. There was a tradition in the ancient world at that time that before the Messiah came, and this probably came from a misinterpretation of, of, uh, of uh, Malachi 4.5, but there was this idea that before the Messiah came, that Elijah would come back to life. And you remember who Elijah was? He was that fiery prophet in the Old Testament that called down fire from heaven. He is the quintessential prophet. In other words, he's going to come back and he's going to prepare the hearts and minds for people, and then the Messiah is going to come. Well, that happened. But not literally, because you see in the next chapter, in chapter 17, Jesus explains that the Elijah that they had seen on the mount in spirit form... That was fulfilled in John the Baptist. John the Baptist came in the spirit, in the fervor of Elijah, and prepared the way. And that's the reason he would say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the reason he would say, there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even willing to step down or stoop down and untie or loose. So some thought maybe it was Elijah. But now think of the implications. If indeed Jesus is Elijah, then what does that mean? It means he can't be the Messiah. In fact, there are some, this is sort of a twist, and I'll throw it out here and you can chew on it. But you know, when Jesus is on the cross and he says, Eli, 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 there is a wave that goes through the crowd saying, oh, he's calling for Elijah. Now, there's a theory, I don't know if you can prove it, but it's really preach as well, that they are making fun of Jesus. They're saying, we know Elijah's coming back, you're not him, so therefore, you know, you're not the Messiah, you can't be the Messiah, uh, you know, if you're the Messiah... You know, where's Elijah? Where, he, where was he at? So, you see, they didn't realize John the Baptist either was the type. But nonetheless, they thought he was Elijah or Jeremiah or John the Baptist or one of the other prophets. You see, there are a lot of people who recognize Jesus as something special. John the Baptist was special. The common people heard him gladly. They were baptized by him in the River Jordan. They flocked out of the city to see this man that dressed in sackcloth and ate honey and locusts. They were enamored with him. There are a lot of people today who are enamored with him, with Jesus. These people of that day were sympathetic to, you know, John's cause. And there are many people today who are sympathetic maybe to Jesus' cause. But they're not followers of Jesus. And so there are a lot of ideas out there and a lot of honest and good hearts out there, I think, that, that are still searching. But now after these names come back and after Jesus says, what's the word on the street? And they say, well, Elijah, Jeremiah, you know, one of the prophets. He says something very interesting. He says, but who do you say that I am? Now the you there in the Greek is very emphatic. Jesus is as if he is pointing his finger directly at the apostles and say, okay, I don't care what the others are saying right now. That's great, that's important maybe, but that doesn't have relevance to your mission. What do you say? Who do you say that I am? Now I want to focus on this phrase for just a moment because I want to talk to the kids mostly, but mostly also, or some also to us old people. You know, we get used to following Jesus. We love meetings. We love maybe even reading the scriptures. We love the songs. It's uplifting. We love the fellowship. We love the association. We love the snacks. We love the, all of these things. Those are all great. But now, that doesn't really address on a more deep philosophical level who Jesus is in your life. Now, Jesus needs to be everything to you. Even more than that girl sitting next to you or that boy, that handsome boy next to you, Jesus needs to be everything to you. And you see, these apostles were going to go out and spread the gospel message, and they were some, sometimes going to be killed. And you have got to be convicted of, sat, uh, of who Jesus is before you're going to be much used to him. Now, that also is a lifetime quest, I have to admit, because sometimes I'm not so committed to Jesus myself. Sometimes I'm a little embarrassed to say, well, you know, I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, especially today. Oh, that is just not popular at all. But nonetheless, we need to take an inventory in ourselves. Who do we think that Jesus is? Now, the apostles are sitting there. 
They think they know Jesus. They've seen all the stuff that Jesus has done, but it's almost like they're nonplussed for a moment. But then Simon Peter is in the midst. Good old Simon. You got to love Simon. He is so us. He is so me. He is so you because he's so human. And old Simon Peter, you got to love him. He's the guy, you know, that seems to be dogging Jesus with questions all the time. And, you know, they're walking on the path, and Jesus is walking, and Peter's like, blah, blah, blah. and then Jesus stops and boom, bumps into him. I, you know, again, that's in my mind's eye. And sometimes my mind's eye is pretty blind. But nonetheless, Peter's kind of a mess. He's always making rash statements. He's kind of flying off the cuff. And, you know, Peter is the one that on the Sea of Galilee, they're out there in that boat. Jesus isn't with him. He's praying, by the way. That storm rises. You remember that story? And Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And old Peter, he's like, oh, he's afraid. He's terrified. But then Jesus speaks out to him and says, uh, Peter, apostle, says, it's me. It is I. I am, literally. Don't, don't be afraid. Peter says, wow, if it's you, then, um, hey, let me come on the water. I don't know that I would have ever thought that. I might have thought, come on over here and get in the boat. I know this is pretty safe right here, at least safer than being out there. But he says, no, let me walk on the water. And you know what Jesus does? He says, come on. Be careful what you ask for, because somebody might just give you the invitation to do it. Make for sure you're ready for the task before, with Jesus before you decide to make a commitment and be, you know, a loudmouth about it. Peter was a loudmouth. He cried over the waves, let me come to you. Jesus said, come on. Peter gets down on the, the sea. He steps out of the boat. Now, these aren't big boats, but he steps out on the water, which that's sort of mind-boggling because you can't step out on water. You sink. But he walks on the water. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. I think we sometimes have this vision that Peter gets out in the bloom and Jesus picks him up. No, Jesus doesn't. Not right away. Peter is walking on the water. And then he begins to look around. Whoa, I'm doing something I'm not supposed to do. This is not natural. Well, by the way, living for Christ isn't natural. Living for Christ is not a natural experience because it is everything against what your body is going to scream for. Young people, sexual activity outside of marriage, your body's going to scream for that. Because you've got hormones, you've got youth, you've got peer pressure, you've got the media cramming stuff down your throat. You're gonna, you're, your, your body, your physical side is going to scream to be doing things that you shouldn't do. Your body's going to scream for peer uh, acceptance by going to the bars or going to the parties or going to the smoking a little weed. You know, up, I don't know who he is here, but up in my area, it's legal now. Not to get into the social things, but or social commentary, but your body and, and those around you are going to scream for you to things that are not natural to do. At least not natural in God's eyes. But he's walking on the water. So Peter begins to look around and realize that, oh, man, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a fish. I'm a fisherman. And a man doesn't walk on the water. The fish are in the water. Well, he begins to get afraid and he begins to sink. And he cries out to the Lord, Lord, save me. Now, before we get too much on Peter's case, and I know I'm way off the text now, but that's okay. This is another sermon. Peter at least recognizes where his hope and help is. That's a start. You know, you're going to sink sometimes in life. Sometimes you will be a failure. I'm sorry. I, I like to think of myself uh, not as a pessimist, but a realist. You're going to fail sometimes. That's okay as long as you learn from it, as long as you realize, okay, even spiritually, maybe I've wandered from the Lord and failed, but he's still there with an outstretched hand. That's who we cry to. That's who Peter cried to. He said, Lord, save me. And then the next little section when you look at that story is they are back in the boat. Now, again, I don't want to read too much into the text. I love exegetical study where you just prove what the text says, but how do they get back in the boat? I can only think of two ways. Either Peter took Jesus' hand and they walked together, or Jesus carried him. I don't know. Either way is pretty good. Jesus saved him. Well, anyway, that's the Peter. And so what does Peter do? Well, he speaks up. And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, let's remember where they are. 
They're up in that heart of paganism where at that probably very moment, there were people somewhere over there worshiping the pagan idols. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, one more side thought before I get too sidetracked. And that is, you know, many times we look at the world and we want to recluse ourselves. We look at the world and say, this world is pagan, this world is ungodly, this world is not a good place, and so let's recluse ourselves. Let's circle the wagons, let's stay really happy with the converted, but let's not expose ourselves too much. You know what? Peter is making a pretty bold confession here in the midst of opposition, or what could have been opposition. I believe that, yes, there are limits to what we should put ourselves through and what our kids through, but I believe that we can be lights in the darkness. In other words, we do need to participate in the world to the degree that God lets us with His principles so that we might be the light to the nations like the Israelites were to be. And so, that's what Peter's doing. He's confessing who Jesus is even though everyone else around probably didn't think quite so much that. You are the Christ. Okay, let's analyze that. Christ. We've talked a little bit about this, but the word is Christos in the Greek. It means the anointed one. Now, we noted that in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is anointed. He is anointed at His baptism as the Holy Spirit comes upon Him in the form of a dove. Jesus is the anointed one. What is that? Well, that's literally where they took, in the Old Testament, oil, olive oil, and poured it on someone's head. You think, oh, yikes. You know, I like the dry look, not the wet look. But nonetheless, what was the purpose of that? It was a signification of a very special task or responsibility. And there were three classes of individuals in the Old Testament that received the anointing. There were the prophets, there were the priests, and there were the kings. Now, what's our topic in this meeting? The kingship of Jesus. Jesus was anointed at his baptized, a baptism and fully publicly recognized. Well, now Peter says, you are the Christ, you're the anointed one. You are the Christ, you're the anointed one. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. First of all, those three genres of leadership in the Old Testament now are wrapped up into one, Jesus. He's our prophet. Okay, Hebrews 1 tells us that God, who in various times and in various ways spake in times past to the fathers or to the ancestors by the prophets, hath in these last days, that is the Christian age, spoken unto us by His Son. Jesus is prophet par excellence. He is also priest. Now, what did the priest do? Well, the Old Testament, remember I said that Jesus fulfilled the mission of Israel? Israel was to be a priesthood for the nations, and God had given them the priesthood with the priests and the sacrifices and the lambs and all of that. Well, Jesus now becomes the fulfillment because He not only is the Lamb of God, but He is also the high priest. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. In other words, He is the one that goes between the people and God. Men are unholy. People are unholy. And so, God takes care of that by giving us the God-man who died as the Lamb so that we might go through Him. And that's the reason we close our prayers, by the way, in Jesus' name. Because it's by His authority that we approach God. Now, by the way, real quick, and too much, too much material. We have a lot of intercessors in our lives, but we only have one mediator. Intercess. I can intercede for you, you can intercede for me, I can intercede, you know, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. But there is only one mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But then Christos, prophet, priest, king. Now, they all knew what the king was. They all knew what the Davidic kingdom was because, again, that history is in their background. And they're longing, at least the Jewish nation is, for another Davidic type king, and that too is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the king. Now, what does the king have? He has authority. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. So, what's really Peter doing here? He's saying, you, in spite of what the opinion out there is, you are the anointed one. You are the prophet, the priest, and the king, and you're also the son of God. Now, we'll pause there and we'll get to that in just a moment. But now, what does a king have? 
A king has a kingdom. That's been one of the things that we've talked about through this whole meeting. But what does a kingdom have? Well, there are four things we've noted that are required for a kingdom. There's first of all is a king. There, are ter- there is a territory. There are subjects, people who adhere to the king. And then there's a law. King, territory, subjects, law. Now, here's where it really comes down to brass tacks, because if we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, of Jesus' kingdom, then we look to him as king. And we are his subject. We give our all. We obey him in totality, and we humble before him. We look to his word, his new covenant, as that relationship that keeps us strong. And even though our, and I've said this several times, even though our action will be imperfect, God is looking not for perfection, but for direction. We serve him relentlessly. That's what really being a Christian, being a servant of Christ is all about. But let me develop that just for a second. And I know we're probably way out of time. I have no idea. But you know, king, what does a king need? Well, he needs allegiance, of course, but he also needs a throne. Now, I said the other evening that every one of us has a throne room in our heart. Our heart is the territory over which Christ hopes to reign. And we've got a throne room in our heart. And there's a throne in that heart, metaphorically speaking, on which something is setting. And you've got to ask yourself, what's sitting on the throne of my heart? Is it my boyfriend or my girlfriend? Is it my worldly interests? Is it my money? Is it, you name it. Now, sometimes things that get on the throne are not wrong in and of themselves, but they take over the throne. That's the problem. Now, if it's sin on the throne and he's reigning, well, then you've got to kick that whole thing out. Can't have just a little bit of sin. You know, sometimes I think in my life, I look at my heart and I think, man, it's really subdivided. We've got a whole subdivision in here. And we've got a little bitty room over here for Jesus. It's got a big padlock on it. Jesus, you stay there. You be good. I'll get back with you when I'm finished all this other stuff. And, you know, sometimes what happens is that room, which maybe initially when we're baptized is pretty good size. We give him the penthouse suite. It begins to get smaller. We begin to go in and build some walls. And we begin, again, to confine him into a space And pretty soon, there's no room for Jesus because we've got too many skeletons in our closets. And they're starting to fill up the house. In fact, some of us are probably building more closets as we speak. A lot of skeletons in our house. Jesus wants to own the house. He wants to be the owner, the ruler, not only of your house, but your lot, your land. If you've got a big farm, he wants to own that too, metaphorically speaking. Now, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's let's just finish up here. I know, I know, you know, there's other things. but Okay, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Son of God. Now, we've talked about this idea of being Jesus being the Son of Man back up a couple of verses earlier, and that's a messianic title. But what does it mean to be the Son of God? If you ever get a study or ever get a chance to do a study on, on sonship in the Scriptures, it's very fascinating. Because I think it's always been hard for us to sort of capre- comprehend and wrap our heads around what it means to be a child of God, but especially with Jesus being the Son of God or the Son of Man. Well, a son in the ancient times had many characteristics, and I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but one is identity. In other words, he has the identity of his father. In other words, that child may look like that father, or he may, you know, have some of the same characteristics or mannerisms. You know, when I'm in Africa, especially with Keith Thompson, we use this illustration all the time when we're teaching on this. Uh, and we do have other sermons, by the way, but uh, this is a good one because uh, it resonates with the folks. And we'll say, okay, Jesus is the Son of God. What does that mean? We'll say, okay, let me give you an illustration. I have a son. I have one son. He was here last night. And then we'll say to the folks, you know something about my son, even though you have never seen him. Now, some of them have seen him, but... Many have not. And they say, no, we don't. We don't know anything about your son. Yes, you do. First of all, you know he's a Mzungu. That means white guy. He's a white guy. Now, of course, I married a white woman, so we got a white guy. But nonetheless, he's got the same genetic components that I do. He's got some of my actions. 
He's a little kinder about his, his sarcasm than I am, but, but he's got some of the same actions. Genetics are hard to get away from. Now, Jesus is not genetically part of the Father, but he has got the same identity as the Father. And so when we see Jesus, we see the Father. In John 14, was it Philip that said, uh, show us the Father? And Jesus said, I've been with you all this time, and you say, show us the Father? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Well, I don't think God looked like a Jew. I don't think he looked like a Palestinian, dark-skinned individual. But the characteristics were there, you see. Sometimes we say, well, man, that, 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 uh, you know, that little boy has his father all in him. We don't mean literally, but we mean he's got the characteristics of his dad. That's what Peter recognizes in Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, well, you know, really, flesh and blood did not reveal this. You didn't learn this from the rabbinic stools. You didn't learn this by studying, Peter. You saw it through me. You, you studied me. Heaven, actually, through me, revealed that to you. And then, of course, Jesus goes on to promise, and we don't have time to develop it now. We've already really done that. But he says, you know, upon that truth, that rock, that great bedrock of truth that, that I'm the Son of God, I'm going to build my congregation. I'm going to build my assembly. I'm going to build my community, if you will. And we noted the distinction between ecclesia and uh, the word church, in the, the real Greek word for church in the New Testament. But now the point is this. As we close, who is Jesus to you? It may be important, it may be interesting to know what your friends think about Jesus or even what your brother or sister in Christ thinks about Jesus. What's the most important? The most important is what you think about Jesus. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because if you say that he is truly the Son of God, then that will affect every fiber of your existence. Not only in how you live and how you talk and what you do and what you say, but also how we'll be judged if we were to go that far. Jesus and our identity with him determines who we are. And so we are students. You know, we are disciples. A disciple means a learner. Do you learn it all at once? No. Some people study for years to learn some particular trade or some particular issue. No, it's a lifelong endeavor to learn and be a disciple of Jesus. But keep that in your heart. Keep that throne empty for Jesus the Christ. Well, those are the thoughts this morning. I appreciate your indulgence. Um, we don't want to close without extending a gospel invitation. There's so much more that we could say and pull out of these passages. But I hope that this will cause you to think about what Jesus means to you. I mean, really, he should mean everything. He and his way, because really, there's no hope without him. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. You can't even get to God outside of me. And the older I get, the more I read about the life of Jesus, the more I certainly see that. That's really the only thing that matters. As you get older, designer clothes, even your own looks will fade. The only thing that matters is Jesus. Give me Jesus. That's it. Well, if you're here this morning and you've never been baptized, you've never had your sins washed away in the blood of Jesus, we'd be happy to assist you in that. Would you hear the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, as King? as Son of God, and then be baptized. Or if you've taken those steps and you find yourself straying out on the stormy sea, uh, cry out to the Lord. Reach out. We'll pray with you while we stand and while we sing.